welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, this is the panel for big data. Uh, actually, you know, we have three big things here: big data, big in, uh, analytics, big insights. Uh, you can see uh, we, our panel here. Uh, we have uh, my name is Tony Shen, and we have Amar, Eric, Peter, and Shahid. Uh, we have a lead group here with lots of experience in this space. It's an exciting space. So first I'll do some sort of like uh, introduction overview. Then we'll take turns, let the panelists uh, share their view insights, uh, their work experience. You can see their bio. Uh, I'm very excited having these gentlemen here uh, sharing their uh, the, the view, the perspectives, and the insights. By the way, how many people uh, heard about big data here? All right, I think majority of people, okay. How many people are doing big data projects today? Okay, pretty good, all right. So we're going to do this uh, just sort of like, you know, generate some interest about big data, everybody excited. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please hold, write it down, hold on, because we want to finish these things. Then we'll have about 20 minutes left at the end, and you are welcome to you know, share your thoughts, experience, concerns, suspicions, whatever, right? And we can address this. So then we uh, do a summary and the closing remarks. So that's me. Uh, I do different things. Uh, I do consulting, so different types of architecture, design, strategy, and uh, um, working with different type of companies, Fortune 100 companies, uh, do publication. Uh, I'm involved in uh, quite a few conferences. I'm part of the sort of like uh, people who helped this conference for years. And uh, do some uh, user group and a forum on different emerging technologies. And this is Arma. Um, uh, Arma is the co-founder and the CTO of Corridor. Uh, it's uh, arguably, I uh, would say, very exciting company in the Hadoop world. Uh, they have the CDH uh, distributed in a lot of areas, uh, including Oracle has this uh, OEM, this. And previously, uh, he worked in uh, Excel partner, uh, VP of engineering at Yahoo. So you can see he has lots and lots of experience uh, built up. Yahoo has the largest Hadoop cluster in the world. So you can see the, uh, his experience. Uh, by the way, his first startup, uh, Vivi Smart, was bought by Yahoo back in uh, middle 2000. So we're excited to have Amar on board. And next uh, is Eric. Uh, Eric is the co-founder and the CTO of Hortonworks. Hortonworks is a spin-off from Yahoo. Uh, Eric, when Eric was in Yahoo, he helped build out this uh, large cluster lots of experience, uh, so uh, we're delighted to have him here sharing the real world. It's, it's a real project, build it out, being there, done that, and share his experience expertise here. And previously, he did work in web services, uh, the company bought by Yahoo, and uh, uh, very deep experience in video. Uh, next is Peter, and I think uh, probably, I'm gonna skip this, because Peter does not need an introduction, in my personal opinion. Last but not least, uh, Shahid uh, on the far side of the table. Uh, Shahid uh, is CEO of uh, Net's, Net Spective uh, Communications. So he does a lot of work for healthcare, uh, for government, and you will see the, his slides. Uh, he's well experienced, more than 20 years experience, doing a lot of things. You can his credential here, uh, very impressive. Uh, there's a lot of things, technical savvy, uh, dealing with strategy, tactics, uh, yeah. How many people are doing healthcare? Do we have any people? Okay, just a few. Uh, well, again, in my personal opinion, is healthcare is a, is a mess. So <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities there. Um, and uh, he will share the, the view of what the government is doing, and he actually is helping the government define the right strategy, how you leverage big data. So we're going to open the floor. Um, you know, we uh, appreciate a very insightful discussion. So we have 10 minutes left. So we do open the floor for some questions, comments, thoughts, you know, what you think, shared experience. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so who volunteers to raise a big question here? Uh, if you look inside of a data center, uh, you cannot really identify its components. It doesn't have identifiers, actually. It doesn't have a name. It doesn't have anything you can actually call it by uniquely. 
So uh, from that point of view, it's, it's even the bigger challenge. Uh, and it's a challenge of data integration. We have not solved it earlier. <laughs> That's, what is our chance to solve it now? The project I mentioned, uh, tracking of people, department labor, same thing. Some of the data, there's no identifier, okay? So, uh, so you have to figure out, like we have to figure out using the person's name, birthday, and the birthplace. And many people would put on the wrong date, wrong birthday. So even the same person have different, you know, different identifiers. One quick thing I can add is that uh, on big data, remember that what changes dramatically is the late binding of searches you can run later. Right? Just because, so the, the reason why we have not been able to do data integration well in the past is data integration was done at the time when the data was integrated, not at the, date, not at the time when the data was analyzed. So there's going to be a big difference in the technologies. I mean, for example, what Hadoop provides and other things provide is just get the data in and we'll worry about it later. Like, for example, this week, how many of you read the story about how many computers does it take to recognize a cat? Did you guys read that? So 16,000 node computer at Google was used uh, through neural networks to figure out what cats look like. And now cats, these computers can now understand and identify cats. They did, the, the fact, the data has been there forever, right? But our, our, our techniques and technologies that we use to teach computers to find patterns, that's going to be the flip in the way that we go from old style science to new style science that the data is already there, we're going to come up with new ways of integrating, finding, et cetera. So I, for one, am not, I'm less concerned about that. I, I, you know, I, I live these problems every day, but they're getting better and better every day because we can make late binding decisions on how to do integration after the data has been pulled together later. Hi, so uh, my name is Xu Xiaofei from Harvey Institute of Technology, China. Uh, my question is that, so if we uh, think about the development procedure of information technology, 20 years ago, there was a, a, a special term about data exploring and information exploring. 10 years ago, we have the, the term about knowledge exploring. And right now, we have big data. Uh, so uh, let's think about in uh, t uh, 10 years later, maybe we will have a big cloud or big services. Yeah. So, uh, but the the, uh, the real real problems uh, we have to to phase two is that, so we try to think about what's the main feature, what's the main scientific issue, technical issue, social issue, in the concept, in the umbrella, under the umbrella of big big data, and what's going on in ten years. That's my question. Okay, so so you, you share your thoughts uh, absolutely. I think uh, we can ask uh, it's. Uh, you know, lots of things, I think the fundamental principles, they are timeless, right? 10 years ago, we have data, data explosion, and if you look at industrialization, you know, all these things, but the rate changed, right? Nowadays, you know, the rate of change, the growth, the explosion is unbelievable, that kind of thing. So in that kind of uncertainty, and let's look at the technology, I would say it's very, very immature, right? We use, you know, you know Peter has been there for years, right, the ER model thing. We try to represent these things, right? In a way, we can store this, we can ingest this, we can get generate some reports out of this. I think another challenge with this huge, massive, massive amount of data. How do we revamp some technologies we used before? How do we innovate? How do we create some disruptive technologies so we can at least you know, deal with it? At least, let alone in you know, the next step is further. How do we generate insight? How do we, because the source is so many. If you look at, the, of course, now I have actually tutorial on this one. So different sources, right? Like a sensor data, all different types of traffic data, astronomy, all these data keep growing. And really, I think I was with the early stage, you know, how do we find a way to effectively deal with leverage technology? You mentioned other factors, absolutely important. Technology, technology is not the only thing, right? We talk about society, we talk about other things, and what does it right mean? And privacy, right? All these things are combined. So the, I, I'd like to, you know, get some thoughts from each panelist. You know, I think this is a very tough, complex problem as a whole, right? We really need to tackle it. What, what do you guys think? Sorry, what's the question? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question? <laughs> I think he, yeah, yeah, why, why don't you maybe the, concisely? The question is that, so yeah, how can you imagine the uh, technical trends and the social uh, trends of a big date 
uh, currently and in the future, in 10 years, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you made, you made a number of very good observations already, and I agree with, with all of them. That's why I was wondering what's the question, because it, it felt like you made the statement already. But um, uh, I completely agree we're at the beginning of this wave. I mean, we are absolutely at the beginning. Uh, so think about, think about the relational databases wave, uh, which was, what, 30, 40 years ago, and how, how long it took them uh, to evolve that and evolve the tools around it. And the uh, same thing is happening here. We're way at the beginning, and uh, one of the things we have to our advantage uh, when for the data integration problem is this late binding uh, thing, which allows us to uh, do um, be more flexible in how we uh, we extract the the information out of the data, uh, and that's where we will need to see lots of innovation uh, going forward. Like I think that's the biggest kind of uh, nut that we need to crack right now is how to uh, make it easier to do that. I mean, I, in terms of, I don't have a crystal ball, but w one thing that's, a, if you think about it, cloud virtualization was kind of the commoditization of storage, and, and that drove grid, that drove a lot of things we've been talking about and seeing for a number of years. And if you look at Hadoop and NoSQL, I think uh, that's the commoditization of storage. I may have misspoke a second ago. We saw compu uh, commoditization of, of compute, and now we're seeing commoditization as storage, and that matters because all of a sudden we can, A, keep an order of magnitude more data for the same price, and B, we don't have to invest so much in organizing it and selecting it. We can keep it in late, that's what everyone's been saying. Well, so next we see commoditization of what? Well, networking and bandwidth, I think, are, you know, as we heard earlier in the day, are, that's coming. Right, that's kind of one place where you're still buying very specialized gear a lot higher than commodity. So if you stitch that together, I mean, it, I think it does mean that you think very differently about data preservation um, and you know structuring your systems for the future. Because when I went to a extreme data talk a few years ago, all the talk was about, you know, I need to choose the right schema so that people can have access to this data. Right. Well, I think if you start to think about data, you know, in, in the medium term with the techno cloud and everything else, that's just not, you don't want to invest so much in that. The key thing is, how do I get this data into a place and into a format where people can understand it? Because now it's cheap to scan through the data. It's cheap to reorganize the data. That's what Hadoop and some of these other technologies, some of the cloud technologies let you do is rent enough computer to sort all that data, choose the subset you want, and then work on it. So, so I think you think differently about that, right? If you're thinking about, I want to open up a sky survey or a genetics database, you know, your challenge is not to figure out what system will host it and answer questions in the future, because you can just put that data up on Amazon now, and it may be, you know, five petabyte database, my God, right? People look at that and think, that's unmanageable but that's gonna look like a spreadsheet by in a few years. So you, I think it's interesting to look through that lens and just, that it is an inflection point where it's no longer owning the instrument, it's understanding how to analyze the data. So I think when you talk about what's next, it is gonna be a much more data science, which you've been hearing. All right, so I, end of comment. <laughs> Let me make a comment on the the future, particularly on the social implication. I think it's a, there's a huge danger of the um, personal liberty and also the privacy of the big data. As you probably noticed, there are a lot of uh, video monitors in you know, a hotel. <laughs> you know, in the past, only erase every 24 hours. Right now, it's so cheap. So they keep on store, store that. That's the big data, okay? That's one thing. So whatever you say, whatever you do, maybe it will be hunted you in the future. Now, give you another example. For all your tax return, you only, the government say only keep for five years. You only need two. In the future, they're gonna change the law. Keep it forever, okay? Now, what did you file 50 years ago, 20 years ago? We'll be in trouble, okay? So, so that's the biggest problem. It's because right now, the government, everybody collecting a lot of information about you and uh, they may not process, that's so a delay processing. They are going to process in the future. So whatever you do, dangerous. <laughs> All right, so uh, I guess I get the last word. All right, 
Okay, so um, 10 years from now, right? If you think about 10 years ago around GPS, around weather data, around things that we know we were, we did not know we were able to do, it wouldn't be something that we could come up with and say, okay, we're definitely going to do that. But wh what we can say right now is that the kinds of data that we're capturing about our social behavior, right? Think about where we were about 10 or 15 years ago. We started digitizing literature. What did digitizing literature give us? It gave us books online, ebooks, et cetera. And now that's a considered a generally solved problem. We're gonna find things out later on, et cetera. We started digitizing behavior. What happened when we started digitizing behavior? Social media data told us about shopping history. Now, I, now Amazon and Safeway can tell me what I'm gonna buy this December before I know it. <laughs> that's reality, right? So now, now take, take that forward 10 years from now and say, what does digitizing behavior do then, right? Is it going to know what I'm thinking? Who knows, right? That's, I think that's look at digitizing literature where it took us, digitizing be, uh, behavior where it's taking us now. The two huge things that are coming up over the next 10 years though is digital biology, digital chemistry slash physics. Digital biology, genes and other things that we're talking about, you know, our phenotypes and stuff like that are, are being di digitized as we speak today. But uh, genomics, proteomics, these are now coming. That's going to be where we can say, we're going to be able to follow what we do with respect to our bodies in the future. This, that's gonna be our GPS of tomorrow. Once you digitize biology, digitize chemistry, and digitize physics, where you don't have to understand, where you don't have to smash two cars together to, to figure out what are the physical uh, properties of that thing, that's what's gonna come from big data. So 10 years from now, the kinds of science, as I said a little while ago, that flip completely on its head where I don't need to actually run the experiment to know what's going on is the future. So just think about that in those five different ways is digitizing literature where it bought us, digitizing behavior where it's taking us today, what happens when we digitize biology, chemistry, and physics. That's 10 years from now. Ready? It's all yours. Okay. Thank you. And lastly, uh, please join me. Uh, thank you, these guys, experts. Very good stuff.